Open your Bibles with me and turn with me to the book of John, chapter 4. And I'm going to preach about worship this morning. John, chapter 4, and let's begin reading with verse 21. This is Jesus at the well. He's in Samaria, and he meets a woman at the well. She's a Samaritan, of course. And the Bible says in verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Can we say amen? Amen. Setting the story here, Jesus is walking through Samaria. Samaria was an area that had an enmity, really, a hatred against the Jews. And so Jesus walks through this area, and he goes to a well. And obviously he's thirsty, and a lady is there. And they start up a conversation, and Jesus tells her of living water, but she's thinking of natural water. And as as it is so often in the book of John, there's the heavenly perspective and the earthly perspective, and the the people thinking earthly can't figure out what Jesus is trying to say because he's speaking spiritually. But anyhow, at one point in the conversation, Jesus looks at her and he says, you've had five husbands, and the man you're with now is not your husband. And she's like, I perceive you're a prophet. And then he goes on to tell her, they get into the discussion about worship. And she says, well, your your, your people say we should worship in Jerusalem. But our folks say we should worship here in Samaria on Mount Gerizim. And Jesus said, you know what? The hour's coming, and I'm going to embellish here. But the hour is coming where you're not going to be worried about worshiping on this mountain or that mountain. Because I'm getting ready to go beyond it. And matter of fact, it's already begun. The Father's just going to look for people who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Not in a temple. Not according to priesthood. Not according to rituals and sacrifices. The Father is looking for people who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. So what does it mean to worship? What does it mean to worship in spirit and truth? You know, worship is just loving back on God like He loves on us. It's a natural response. I've taught world religions through the years at universities, and here's what I noticed. Every culture worships something because it's innate in the heart of man to worship something. Every culture, indigenous cultures, uh, animistic cultures, you look, all of the world throughout all human history have worshipped something. The only culture that I could find that didn't worship something, but with a caveat, is the modern intellectual, advanced Western culture. But they've replaced worship with material things. And trying to fill the longing of man to worship with material things. And that's it. So the history of man has searched for worshiping something. To worship something. So we were created to worship God. Because we were created by God, and God is spirit. Jesus said, God is spirit. And if you worship him, you must worship him in spirit and in truth. So when we worship him, we worship him spirit to spirit, and we worship him in truth, which either means according to the biblical truths or according to sincerity. That we come before him and we worship him with a sincere heart. That we worship him with a sincere heart. You know, it's interesting. I was just thinking this morning. When I've seen people get radically saved who, weren't, who didn't grow up in church. And some of the hardest people I've seen come and get radically saved. And they became some of the greatest worshipers I've ever seen in my life. Not because they learned it, but because they finally found it. Because since we do, since we do want to worship something... And since we were created to worship something, if we don't know how to worship or who to worship, we'll create a system. 
We'll create a religion. We'll create some kind of man-made structure and get mired up in it trying to worship something. You know, I have a friend named Mike Shreve, and Mike used to say it this way. He would say there's three heavens in the Scripture. There's the heaven, there's the atmosphere that we live in, and then there's the starry heaven, and then there's the abode of God. And the Bible said Satan is the prince of the power of the air, so he lives in the second heaven. And, and he has a limited authority in the second heaven. And so every attempt of man to worship or attempt of man to get to God, if it's just of his own doing, it will get mired up in the second heaven because it gets caught up in the realm of spirits. But the Bible said there was one who came down from the third heaven. Philippians chapter 2, he emptied himself and he came down and took upon himself the form of a servant. And now Hebrews, now he is the way maker or the pathfinder. And now he's gone back to heaven, paving a way for you and I to be able to get back to God. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody shout amen. amen. So let me go and take you on a journey through the Old Testament. And show you how worship developed in the Old Testament, at least a piece of it. When God brought the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage, he didn't lead them directly into the promised land. He told Moses in his original call when he spoke to him out of the burning bush, he said, you're going to go bring the people of Israel out of Egyptian bondage and you're going to bring them back to this mountain. The mountain, Mount Sinai, where he met with Moses. And that's exactly what Moses did. They came out of Egyptian bondage and they went back to Mount Sinai. Moses goes up into the cloud and goes up on the mountain and spends 40 days. And there God gives him the law and God shows him shows him a, a schematic, a blueprint of what worship is going to look like. And then he comes back down and they start building a tabernacle where they can worship God. It was a tabernacle of animal sacrifice of the priests working, representing people. I believe God intentioned for every one of them to be priests. He said, I've called you to be a kingdom of priests. I think they forfeited that right when they worshiped the golden calf and only the tribe of Levi stood up and said, when Moses said, who's on the Lord's side? And the Levites became the priesthood. My personal interpretation. But then he developed the whole Old Testament tabernacle system. And it was like steps to get to the presence of God. There was an outer court where sacrifice happened. And the priests would do their duties and wash themselves and sacrifice the animals. Then you would walk into the first compartment called the holy place which had the candelabra that were to be burning continually, a table of fresh bread called the bread of, show, bread of face or the show bread. And then there was the altar of incense that stood at the back of the holy place. And it was an altar of coals where the priest would sprinkle incense upon it and then the incense smoke would rise. And so they did their work in there. I just see types and shadows, and forgive me if I'm going to stretch it too far, but I believe the candelabra represents the power of the Holy Spirit lighting our lives continually. I believe the showbread represents the Word of God being fresh daily. And then I think the table, the, the altar of incense represents the prayer and intercession and worship that ascends to heaven and not only ascends to heaven, but I believe the fabric and the fragrances, would, uh, the fragrances and the smoke would work through the fabric into the final compartment called the most holy place. And in the most holy place was one piece of furniture, as we call it, and that was the Ark of the Covenant. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Maybe you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. But the Ark of the Covenant was in the most holy place. And that Ark was just a a Ark made out of a certain type of wood covered and overlaid with gold. And it had a table or a, uh, it had a lid on it called the mercy seat. And then it had these two angelic cherubim overlooking the mercy seat. And the presence of God would dwell and manifest there over the mercy seat. And and God told Moses to set it in the camp in a certain arrangement. And it would be setting in the middle of the camp of Israel. And all the tribes would 
camp around it. I think it represented that worship and the Lord must be the center of the community of Israel. Just as the Lord and worship must be the center of our lives today. And then there would be a visible sign of his presence. It would be a cloud by day, a fiery pillar at night. And as long as the cloud stayed in place and the fire stayed in place, the children of Israel just went about their lives and stayed in that location. When the cloud began to move, they knew it was time to pack up and go. And they would pack up and they would move wherever the cloud moved. There's something about having the presence of God in your life and giving Him the center place in your life. I believe you hear from the Lord and are able to move with the cloud easier. But then, but then there was a way. So there's a way into the presence of God. But then by the time of David, we see something different happening. That David, by the time of David, the uh, tabernacle had been out in the wilderness and it had, had an interesting journey. And David knew where the Ark of the Covenant was, so he sent some men down to get the Ark and to bring it to Jerusalem. And so they went down there and he sent his best he had and they went down and tried to bring the Ark up. But when the Ark started shaking and was unstable on the cart, they reached out to steady it and God struck them dead. A man named Uzzah, boom, dead. And David was upset about this and, and, and thought, what is... So he went back to the scriptures and he looked at the proper way to bring the ark back. And this was his heart. He was a worshiper. I believe he had learned to worship out in the sheep field, out in the sheepfold. That's where he got the Psalm 23 and that's where he was in contact with God. And he was a worshiper. No wonder God called him to be king. And when he ascended the throne, there's a, there's a psalm that talks about the glory of God coming and, and it, it's really a coronation psalm. It's like the inauguration psalm of David's kingdom. And when, what he talks about is the glory coming and worship because he was a man after God's own heart. And when he became king, I mean his, you know, talk about first 100 days in office, his first 100 days was let's get the presence of God in. And then even when he was deposed of his kingdom by his son Absalom, I don't read where he went off into the wilderness and, and cried about losing his throne or cried about losing his armies or his wealth. But he went out there and he said, My heart's long for the courts of the Lord. I want to be back in the place of worship. So what happened? So he brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. And this time they did it the Bible way. And they came in with shouting and rejoicing and dancing. And he got so amped up, he started dancing. The Bible said he danced with all of his might. And Saul's daughter, Michael, looked out. It was his wife and said, hey, you're, you're making a fool of yourself in front of all the people of Israel. And he said something like this. Listen, this isn't between me and you. This is between me and my God. And if you keep on aggravating me, I will become even crazier than this. I will become more undignified than this. You think it isn't dignified for a king to dance? Baloney. I'm going to dance with all my might before the Lord. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Some of y'all came in church here first time and you thought you shouldn't act like that in church. And now you're acting just like us. Hallelujah. I remember my mom went to church, and she said, one thing's for sure, Hans, I'll never act like those people. Because we went to a church that was on fire. You know, I'll never act like those people. And I'm telling you the truth, and Mom probably killed me for saying this, but I remember her praying for the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And one night I was up on stage playing guitar, and I remember my mom at the altar praying, and she was praying earnestly with all of her heart. And then I looked back a little bit later, and I saw her rolling <laughs> on the floor. And I said, my gosh, my mom's a holy roller. I've seen it right now, man. A holy roller. She fell right in and acted like the rest of us. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. God is good. God is good. You were created to worship Him. You were created to give Him praise. Like David, have a heart. So he brings the ark back. And the Bible says, David set it in a tabernacle. Evidently a tent that he had built. Now he's setting it 
in Jerusalem in a tent that he had built. I want you to read about this. Turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. And one scholar said it like this. The worship in David's tabernacle was like a modern charismatic worship service. Is anybody in this church today? So here's what he says. Let's look at chapter 15. Chapter 15, verse 16. Then David spoke to the leaders of the Levites, the priests, to appoint their brethren to be the singers accompanied by instruments of music, stringed instruments, harps, and cymbals by raising the voice with resounding joy. David, as king, set up a massive worship team. And he said, now we're going to have all kinds of musicians and with all kinds of instruments, and we're going to have choirs singing, and what are they going to do? Sing sad songs? Mama's not dead, she's only sleeping. No, they're going to raise their voice with resounding joy. They're going to raise their voice with resounding joy in the tabernacle of the Lord. Come on, somebody. Notice chapter 16, verse 4. Chapter 16, verse 4. And he appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord to commemorate, to thank, to praise the Lord God of Israel. Go before the ark and just give him thanks. And I'm going to appoint you Levites. You're going to be paid by me or by the temple treasury or whatever. And you're going to be 24-7 on a rotation to stand before the presence of the Lord and give thanks. So he has choirs and he has musicians. And now he has a priesthood just to stand before the presence of the Lord and give thanks. Can somebody shout hallelujah? Look at verse 8 of chapter 16, 1 Chronicles. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him, sing songs to him, talk of his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Verse 35, and say, save us, O God, our salvation. Gather us together and deliver us from the Gentiles to give thanks to your holy name, to triumph in your praise. Verse 29, give thanks to the Lord God, God and uh, gl- give Him the glory to His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. So there's a term here for worship that means to bow down and reverence God. And there's a term for praise here, which means to celebrate or sing His praise in song. Somebody shout amen. amen. Just showing you. Singing, music, Levites giving thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, praise, notice verse 10, glory in His name, let the hearts of those rejoice. It's to be a place of rejoicing. 1 Chronicles chapter 15 verse 28, when He's bringing the ark back in, says thus all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn and with trumpets and with cymbals making music with stringed instruments and harps. Notice there's stringed instruments, there's harps, there's cymbals, and there's horns. There's all three forms of music. All three forms of music are in David's tabernacle. Not only that, the people are shouting as the ark comes. This isn't a church of the chosen frozen. This is every few moments. Raising up a shout because the, the glory of God or the ark is coming back. Amen. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. The Bible says not only that, but he set up 4,000 singers. That he set up 4,000 singers to give God praise. Chapter 23, verse 4. 4,000 were gatekeepers and 4,000 praised the Lord with musical instruments, which I made, David said, for giving praise. So he had 
4,000 gatekeepers, 4,000 musicians, and David is quoted here as saying, playing instruments that I created for giving praise. So not only was he a king, not only was he a conqueror, not only was he a worshiper, he created worship instruments. you got to love it, man. I mean, you know, in, in the guitar world, there are luthiers who build guitars, and there's people who play guitar, and then there's people who build guitars, and sometimes the guitar builders play too. Most of them do. But you've got to love it. When you're talking about loving it, you want to love it, and you want to get down and work in that wood and bend in that wood and staining that wood or treating that. I mean, you've got to love He must, what? And what kind of time does a king have on his hands to build instruments? He gave priority to the presence of the Lord. You say, I'm too busy to worship. I'm too busy to go to church. Baloney. You can make room. You've got to make God a priority in your life. My grandma said, used to say, people do what they want to do. Did I just say that? Come on, David made the presence of God a priority. Just like the woman who was childless, her and her husband built a room on for Elijah or Elisha because they made the presence of God a priority. And went then because of that, they got a son. And then when that son died, because of that, the prophet raised him back to life. And then when that woman had to move away and lost her property, come back in the, 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 the subsequent chapters, the judge gives her her property back. Why? Because I believe she valued the presence of God. David valued the presence of God and he was a worshiper extraordinaire to where he's making it his top priority. I'm going to have the presence of God in this kingdom. We're going to have people worshiping. I'm going to pay the Levites. We're going to have the priests giving thanks before God. We're going to have this thing right. We're going to have the instrumentation. We're going to dance. We're going to shout. We're going to rejoice. All the nations will know that God of heaven is the one we're worshiping. He's the one seated here. He, we trust it because when you worship you realize I'm not in charge he's in charge and you realize I can't do everything on my own I've got to trust somebody higher than me who can do it for me come on true worshipers give him a shout this morning hallelujah So why are you talking about David's tabernacle and the Old Testament mosaic tabernacle and all that stuff? Well, let's go back over into the New Testament. Acts chapter 15. There's a council that's held. There's a big church meeting that's held. And the apostles have called in Paul. Because Paul has been preaching to the Gentiles. And the movement of Christianity was initially only a Jewish movement. But they're hearing these reports Peter, chapter 10, had gone and preached to a Gentile and his whole household got saved. Paul's been out there among the Gentiles and the nations. And they call these guys in and they have to give a defense of what they're doing. And when the apostles heard that defense, they stood up and said, you know what? This, it seems good to us in the Holy Ghost. This sounds good to us in the Holy Ghost. You guys continue preaching to the Gentiles. They give a few directions. And then James, the brother of Jesus, stands up and says... It's written in the scripture, Amos chapter 9 verse 11, that in the last days I will raise again the tabernacle of David. That I will rebuild the tabernacle of David that has fallen down. What, what in the world is he talking about and why that scripture pulled out of that context? Because he's talking about God's desire for all people from all nations to be able to worship God and have access to the throne of God. What God was doing in the Old Testament was picking out Israel as a prototype nation who would know how to worship Him and they would become the example for all of the world to worship God in the future. And David's tabernacle in particular was the example, not his Davidic reign, 
that God was rebuilding through the coming of Jesus the Messiah, but also the worship where you could come before the presence of God openly with the shouts of joy and, and, and the music resounding and the dancing and the praise happening in the very presence of the Lord. Because when Jesus was crucified, the Bible says the veil of the temple was rent in two, signifying that now the glory of God wasn't isolated to a certain holy room over the Ark of the Covenant, but now the glory of God has gone out, and now all people can have access to His presence. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. You can all have access to His presence and now worship Him like David worshiped Him in the Old Testament. Come on, somebody give Him a shout of praise. Come on, give him a shout. Hallelujah. In the book of Matthew chapter 21, Jesus makes his triumphal entry, seated on a donkey going into the city of Jerusalem. And there are people shouting his praises, singing, Hosanna, son of David. And the religious leaders get mad and try to calm them down. And Jesus said, have you never read that out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. And he said, you guys have made this a den of themes, whereas God said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. What in the world is he talking about? He's quoting Isaiah 56. And in Isaiah 56, Isaiah is talking about a day that is coming when the Gentiles will be able to come into the temple of the Lord. And he said, there's a day coming when the eunuch will no longer say, I'm a dry tree because eunuchs couldn't have access to the presence. And there's a day coming when the foreigner and stranger will no longer be excluded. There's coming a day when all nations. So Isaiah says, he shall have a house of prayer for all nations. I think what Jesus was doing when he braided that whip, went into the temple complex, I think he was saying the day of this thing is coming to an end. The day of this era and this season is coming to an end. I am ushering in a kingdom where no longer will there be people excluded from my presence. But I'm ushering in a kingdom and worship's going to look like something like it looked like my forefather way back in the line of the line of Judah back in David's day. I'm raising back up the tabernacle as God wanted it. And it's going to be a place of freedom, a place of worship, a place where strangers can come, where the broken can come, where the hurting can come, where everybody can come and have access to the presence of God. You were created to worship Him. Your highest calling is to come into His presence and give Him praise. That's where you're most fulfilled. It's when you worship Him the greatest. Come on, somebody, give Him a shout. Your hands were created to clap. Your voice was created to sing. Your feet were created to dance. Your heart was created to love God. Oh, hallelujah. Come on in the water. Come on in the deep. Come on into the flow. Come on into the river. God is calling. Whosoever will, let him come and drink of the waters of life. Whoso, come on in. Oh, give him a shout of praise. Woo, come on, just shout it out. Hallelujah. When you worship, it's what you were created to do as a spirit being. Your spirit wasn't created to eat Lay's potato chips and watch Netflix. That's what the flesh does. Your spirit was created to connect with the Spirit of God. You deep calls unto deep. God is calling out to you by His Spirit. It's got to get beyond your mind. It's got to get beyond your habitions. It's got to get beyond your tradition. It's got to get beyond all of your failures. God's calling you into the deep. And He's saying, come on in. Hallelujah. I need a worshiping bride that knows how to enter into my presence. Come on, somebody, give me a few more minutes. Hallelujah. Take this as a dream. Don't take this as a Bible. Anytime somebody has a dream or vision, you take it as a dream or vision and you judge it. You don't take it as Scripture. There was a man who had one of these near-death experiences. 
And he said he saw heaven. He saw the gates of heaven. And at the gate of heaven, there was an angel. Now, again, this is a vision. There was an angel teaching people how to worship before they walked through the gates. I don't want to get to heaven and have to take worship for dummies. I want to, be a, I want to have a PhD in worship by the time I get there. I want to be a well oiled machine by the time I get there. Hallelujah. And I want to be dancing and rejoicing my way all the way in the gates. <laughs> oh, come on somebody. Hallelujah. Let me tell you this. The Bible says that the gifts of the Spirit shall pass away. Paul talked about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He said, where there be tongues, they shall cease. Where there's knowledge, it shall cease. There are things that we're operating in that we need now. We need to speak in tongues now. We need to prophesy now. We need to heal the sick now. But in, the, in heaven, we're not going to need all those gifts because everybody's going to be healed. Everybody's going to know as they are known. We're going to have the greatest prophet ever, God himself, direct knowledge. Not coming through a glass darkly. We're going to have all that in heaven. We need those gifts now. But he said, there's one thing that will last forever, and that's love, right? Well, let me tell you some other things that's going to last forever. Worship will last forever. Prayer will last forever. Why? Because in the book of Revelation chapter 4 verse 8, I see that there are these living creatures who have angelic wings and they fly constantly crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And the Bible said every time they cry that, the 24 elders fall on their faces and cast their crowns at His feet. I see John seeing a number that no man can number, hallelujah, who've washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. They've come out a great tribulation, it said, and they're standing before the Lamb worshiping Him. There's a great host, thousands of angels worshiping Him, an innumerable no number of souls that have gone on before. So when you and I worship, we join with the chorus of heaven, worshiping God. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. Come on, give Him praise. Hallelujah. Come on, stand to your feet and just give Him praise. Come on, join in with the angels and join in with the chorus of heaven saying, God, we worship you. So, you know, it, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, <laughs> there's somebody wrote a book years ago called Men Hate Church. I, I, I rebuke that. I love church. I'm created for it. Maybe the way man's created it might be a bad deal, but I'm telling you what, I'm created to worship. If you hate worship, man, you're, what are you going to do in heaven? Now, I know we're going to do many things, we're what we're created to do in heaven, but what I see from Revelation is there's worship and intercession going on all the time in heaven. I don't think we're just going to worship and pray all the time. God's going to give us tasks to do, I personally believe. But nonetheless, it's the atmosphere of heaven is worship and adoration, being connected to God without flesh as a veil. You know, there's so much power in worship. I want to just encourage you that when we're worshiping here in the church, if it isn't your favorite song, just go ahead and push through and worship. Because it isn't a concert where you're waiting for your favorite song. It's joining in with what's happening in heaven and among my brothers and sisters, and it's worshiping. That's what it's about. Let's push in. And then sometimes we sing songs of rejoicing. We enter His gates with, Lord, I give you thanks. God, I thank you for bringing me through another week. Then sometimes we exhort one another. Come, bless the Lord with me. And I'm telling you, come on, I'm encouraging you. But then when we push beyond the veil, our goal is to get to the place to where we're worshiping vertically. Me talking to Jesus. No longer is it about my brothers and sisters. Now it's I adore you and I want to see you. And it's all about you, Lord. And we start singing directly to Him. And it's like we've come out of the outer courts into the holy place, on into the most holy place, getting into that point where God can start downloading. And we hit that sweet spot of worship. I don't know, the other night, 
Dana and I watched something with uh, Rodney Howard Brown that happened years ago. He was in a meeting in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and there was no music being played, and the people began worshiping. They just started lifting their voices, and it went on for I don't know how long, and the title of the video is "Listen" or something like Listen to the Angel Choir, because it was as if you could hear, mixed within the voices of the people, something that sounded like an angelic choir. And I thought about it. When we're worshiping, there are angels worshiping. And when we're worshiping, we're joining with the praise that's going on in heaven. Even the angels that are assigned to us, and I believe there's probably thousands in this room right now, that there are angels who worship before the throne constantly. And they're staying in tune with the Father through a constant worship relationship. And they're sent here to serve you and I. I don't know about you, but I've contacted. I've been, I, I know, I've said, you, call me crazy, but I, I, I know without a shadow of a doubt an angel sat in my car one night and rode with me from a meeting I had in Virginia to a meeting I had in North Carolina and started speaking and giving me scripture references. And you know what they were? Those scriptures I read you out of 1 Chronicles 16. And I felt he was communicating that my ministry would be used in healing and, and, and evangelism, but it would be connected to worship. I'm talking, this is 20 plus years ago, that it would be connected to the worship. And then I had a prophetic man come to Washington, D.C. and preach for us. And he looked at me and he said, you flow in and out of the word and worship seamlessly. And I've never said that publicly maybe, but it was something that I felt when an angel was sitting in the seat next to me years ago. Call me crazy, but it's my testimony. Also years ago, I went for the first time to Montana and preached. I woke up in the middle of the night and I was uh, in a cabin. In the middle of the night, I woke up and I felt it was kind of a push for me to break through in that tent meeting. And I just felt an angel standing next to me. And I felt he said, there's another one on the other side of the bed because your assignment has increased. Hallelujah. And that night, I don't know, I had peace come over me. The next night I went under that tent and all heaven broke loose. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, you have angels watching over you. They're sent as ministers to the heirs of salvation. And they're, I think they're tuned into heaven worshiping all the time. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I want to worship and join in with the angel band. I want to join with the, with the nations worshiping all over the globe today. I want to join in with the saints looking over the banister of heaven, the great cloud of witnesses saying, Hans, give him praise. You can make it. You can make it. Worship through the battle. Worship through the discouragement. Worship in the good times. Worship in the bad times. You're going to make it. Come on, let's lift our hands and give Him glory in here this morning. Come on, just lift your voice right now. Just, you were created to worship. Do what you were fashioned to do. pray right here. There's a word we use often. It's called secular. Seculore in Latin comes from the term not heavenly. Bound to time. Not heavenly but bound to this earth. And so we live in the secular realm. We live and operate not in heaven but we live in this time bound environment. But when we worship, we tap into the sacred. We tap into that which transcends time. We tap into that realm that isn't bound by this earth. And we get out of the seculore into the sacra or the, the sacred. We go and lift up. That's why when you come to church, sometimes it's like you just entered into heaven. All the saints gathered. 
We've all come from different places this week, all have our different stories, but we're gathering here for one reason, and that's to tap into that realm that we're, where we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, and God's calling to us, and we're calling to Him, and it lifts us out of the secular into the sacred place. Oh, hallelujah. There's your Latin lesson for today. Come on, every hand lifted right now. Come on, every hand lifted. You said, Brother Hans, I'm not even serving the Lord. Now you're created to worship. Won't you step on in right now? Go ahead and just begin to praise Him with your own voice. Come on, hallelujah. Come on, begin lifting your voice. Hallelujah. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching and listening to the podcast. And I hope these sermons have been a great blessing and source of encouragement to your life. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing today, Jesus is the answer. I can tell you, He is the answer for your life. I'd love to pray with you before we leave here. So if you never accepted Christ into your life, or if you just have a need in your life, let's lift it up to the Lord right now. Come on, pray with me. Lord Jesus, wash me from all sin. I accept you into my life. I repent of all sin and I place you on the throne seat of my heart. Lord, I pray right now, you minister to each and every one who just prayed that short prayer with me. Whatever situation they're facing, give them grace right now. Give them the power they need to get through it, Lord. Give miracle signs and wonders today, Lord, to those listening in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We declare it done in Jesus' name. Love you guys. Thank you for tuning in and listening and watching us.